basis in all yours yeah thank you thank you nimesh thanks a lot um this is this is an honor being here today and as you have seen in the video nice has put together an extraordinary set of scholars and the best of minds in international relations from around the world and uh, pramod is a former colleague and a friend a long time friend uh, so it's it's great to see him and nice uh, doing such great work um, you know putting together such a distinguished panel of speakers and across a range of issues and topics um, without wasting much time i am as i said i'm very privileged to be here today and thank you pramod for organizing this and your team for organizing this um this particular panel uh, is on myanmar the situation in the current situation in myanmar as many of you must already know uh, earlier this year on the 1st of feb uh, there was a military coup in myanmar the tatmadaw the military in myanmar effectively um, overthrew the civilian government and took charge of the country declaring a state of emergency and also arrested former president win min and uh, state councilor ong san suu kyi um, and Uh, a section of the senior leadership of the National League for Democracy. Uh, the coup came, notably speaking, the coup came after months after the November 2020 general election, in which the NLD uh, secured a landslide win for the second time, uh, and the military claimed that the results were fraudulent, and hence initiated the coup. Since the coup, a lot has happened in Myanmar. um you know a, a a very vibrant and nationwide resistance movement or anti coup movement has emerged which is now known as officially known as the civil disobedience movement or cdm um a bunch of civilian lawmakers from nld and other parties have also come together to form a sort of uh, shadow government or a parallel government uh, known as the nug or national unity government of myanmar Uh, at the same time the military has also unleashed extraordinary levels of violence on civilian protesters unarmed civilian protesters and so far according to one estimate more than 1000 civilians have been killed since february which is a staggering number also a painful reminder of what's happening in myanmar i'm actually delighted that today we have uh, a set of speakers who are very very well acquainted with this country have worked extensively on this country and also one of them uh, comes from myanmar so today for this panel we have thinzar shunli yi and i'm very happy that she is able to join us from myanmar today she is a political activist and campaigner in myanmar uh, and currently the advocacy coordinator at action committee for democracy development uh, mathin thinzar thank you so much for joining us i'm glad you could join us from there um we would hope that you would tell us a little more about what's going on on the ground there what's the mood on the ground uh in terms of the uh, you know resistance to the coup the political dynamics around the shadow government or parallel government and ug and also talk a bit about uh, some of the foreign relations dynamics of the situation for instance the influence of china uh, asean and other regional neighbors such as india next we have bidhayak das bidhayak has been a friend for a long time who's a journalist and researcher at the institute of human rights and peace studies at mahidol university thailand uh bidhayak has worked extensively in myanmar in various capacities and is very very deeply acquainted with the political dynamics of the country and he is also based in assam at the moment uh, so not just myanmar uh, bidhayak has his hands firmly on the situation along the fluid india myanmar border in northeast india so i'm hoping bidhayak can you know uh, you can tell us a little about the sub regional implications of the coup on the border um and also talk about some of the internal dynamics uh, in the country according and your reading of the situation perhaps uh finally we have chavi vashisht who's a research associate at vivekananda international foundation uh she very closely tracks myanmar on a near daily basis and uh, the situation in myanmar and we are hoping that chavi can also give us a picture of or her reading of the situation uh, based on her her constant sort of engagement uh with with the news that's coming out of the country and also perhaps tell us a little bit about you know speak a little bit about the position of uh, india on myanmar uh as pramod tells me we don't have much time actually we have this is a short panel we have slightly in fact we have slightly less than an hour to complete the panel so what we'll do is for the first 20 to 30 minutes we'll let the speakers uh, you know make their remarks and then we'll go for a q and a discussion and feel free to drop in your questions in the chat box uh and to each speaker i would request you to not exceed uh, about 7 minutes uh, in your remarks 
uh, so that you know we can have a fruitful discussion when we can have more engagement from the audience um, after your remarks without wasting much time um, I know according to the order I think Vidhai comes first but Vidhai if you're fine with that uh, may we start with Tinzar okay. hello uh, sorry Tinzar yes uh, we will start with Tinzar Ma Tinzar please uh, can you hear me yes uh, can you hear me too yes loud and clear please go ahead Thank you. Thanks for inviting me and also thanks for joining today for your interest in Yama as well. As you see, um, it's already 2000, uh, 208 days after the coup in February 2021. And so far, we have lost more than 1,023 people. And at the same time, the military Honda has been arresting people. They have already arrested more than 7,000 people at the moment. Um, they keep arresting our young people at midnight. So many people inside country stay living with that fear every day. Like um, also they are trying to take in control of the whole country and the administration. So what, what show is that? Uh, that show the military sponsor is not stay in power. It's not in power or it's not in control. They could not, they could not secure the um, territorial or the administration executive pillar or judicial pillar. So they are struggling so hard because the resistance is going really strong. Um, at the same time, the young people um, in Myanmar, they've been um, risking their life, um, organizing different uh, flat strikes almost every day out on the street. So uh, even today that um, some of my friends uh, who joined in Mandalay strike in Mandalay in the middle part of Myanmar, they got arrested because when they organized flash strikes, you know, they just quickly did it within like a few minutes and then they try to disperse themselves. But at the same time, there are a lot of informers from the military Honda and then they, they managed to grab these young people after the strikes, you know, that's almost every day. But young people on the street, they are not skipping any day and they are still um, protesting at the best um, they can. So, um, so, so that resistance and going strong, the civil disobedience movement also is um, undergoing the uh, civil disobedience, um, uh, civilian staff, they are determined to uh, go till the end, till the end of the revolution, till we can eventually overthrow the military Honda. So the coup is day of failure and the coup council, uh, what we see overall after seven months, nearly a seven months is the, uh, the coup council, the junta lack the legitimacy. Also they are, uh, they lack the trust uh, among the uh, general public at the same time, the capability and the resources to stabilize the country. Um, we can see that after we had a COVID and a COVID situation that we have lost many um, people in uh, wine in the peak of the COVID situation in July and June. So um, that's how I think Nyama also is um, having at the same time another um, challenge, which is a um, conflict. We have more than uh, one, 100 ethnic arms army around the whole country. Basically, the Honda has control over only some territories, you know, such as mainland in the in the capital city, like Nebiro in the middle part of the country, but still the resistance is going really strong. So basically, right now, um, the revolution as a whole, and just to explain you, we are having three front lines. The first front line is the political front line. So the political front line, in that political front line, we have already formed a national unity government, uh, which is formed with the deposed parliamentarians and uh, the, um, the NUG also have different several ministries that comprised with 48% uh, of the Burmese majority and 30% of the Kachin population, as well as 10% of the Korean nations. Um, so the national unity government also have formed, like it's come out as a, as a newly, um, uh, a newly formed of the government that we have never seen, such as including the woman percent percentage, like 26% uh, of the women in the, in the cabinet, as well as the young people as well. But at the same time, national unity government is still far from perfect. But the military Honda is trying to also take control of the um, uh, the, the whole government, uh, the whole country, by forming a caretaker government. And uh, also now we are at the same at the same time we are struggling to gain the legitimacy in the U.S. Security Council in September. So this is the uh, the current challenge that we are facing. 
Um, at the same time, uh, the M revolution is still there because the M revolution is nothing new inside the country. As I explained, we have more than uh, 100 ethnic M school and the, uh, the Junta has have uh, clashes with the 28 ethnic M army uh, since February. Within the seven months, they have a lot of, there are a lot of different M clashes so mostly in Kachin state, and the second is in the Karen state and also followed by the Zagain region. So you can see the clash, the clashes gets keep um, increasing and um, the ethnic army such as KIO, KIA and uh, KNU, they are also taking um, uh, quite a large number of um, um, control in their own areas as well. And so the, that means that conflicts are also going forward. So um, at the same time, the young people, they turn themselves into, a, a, um, into you know, M's revolution uh, members, and they also join a different M's army to join in the revolution. There are another revolution at the same time uh, called re an ideological revolution. So these revolutions basically is um, trying to take root of the racism and all uh, discrimination at the same time, trying to uh, uh, lay out uh, foundations for the federal democratic nation. So these ideological, uh, ideological uh, dynamic is also going on. And it's like, for example, recently the young people apologize and take a public stance on, uh, in favor of the Rohingya population inside the country. They are also um, urging the national unity government to apologize to the ethnic minorities for all the atrocity that have in the past uh, 70, 70 years. So this is kind of a, a, a different dynamic is what's happening in Myanmar. At the same time, the COVID situation is such a challenge um, that we have only 3.3% uh, being fully vaccinated. And the number was growing, especially in uh, mid uh, July and uh, June. So uh, we have lost more than 14,000 people in the COVID pandemic. And at the same time, the military junta is trying to weaponize the COVID pandemic to take control of the administrations, and they are basically using the neighbors' countries such as India and also Thailand to gain the to to get the vaccine like COVID vaccine or COVID shield. You know, in the past before the coup, at the same time, even after the coup, that India have imported um, the vaccines to the military junta, and military junta is using these vaccines to um, to um, to vaccinate the people inside the country. At the same time, in parallel, the national unity government is trying to form a national head committee. It has already been set up, trying to vaccinate the people. So in, in, uh, as a conclusion, the revolution is uh, taking its momentum, going for a full-blown conflict. People are actually preparing mentally, physically for it. They are waiting for it, basically. That's the main thing. And if, if uh, before, if the international intervention, like humanitarian intervention, couldn't be there in time, then we're gonna go in for the the real full blown uh, conflict. There will be more people dying, and you know, the the situation will really get worse. At the same time, we need to reinforce the um, the current strongest revolution force called NUG. We need to help them and support them so that they can get better and be a stronger force against the military Honda. And the military has been giving out different promises that um, another, my message is don't be deceived by their promises because they've been giving out different promises in the past 10, 30 years, 70 years, and we have learned the lesson. And now we all are decided, determined to go against the military junta together. So the last message for me is um, Myanmar democracy movement is so somewhat we call the strongest um, amen, you know, amen in our history. And we are in the reunion positions. So we, if we achieve the democracy in the federal, in our revolution, that could inspire our other different uh, neighboring countries for a better nation and better uh, region in, the, in Asia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, I have a couple of, thank you for insightful remarks and a lot of food for thought. I have a couple of questions myself, but I think I'll wait for all the speakers to finish and then I can answer later. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Uh, next, we have uh, Bidhayak Das. Bidhayak, uh, please take the stage. Thank you, Angshuman, and thank you, Nice, for putting together this uh, panel. And to all the speakers, I think uh, I will save the pleasantries for the later because we have shortage of time. So let me just get straight into the topic. So you see, I feel very sad today and a uh, bit emotional because two countries that are close to my heart, Myanmar and Afghanistan, both are in chaos and we are hel helplessly watching, we are. 
and we have to accept the fact we are. And Angshuman, you told me while we discussed this yesterday that you wanted me to look at the security and the regional ramification of whatever is happening in Myanmar. So I'll talk about that. And you know, whatever uh, Mathinzar has just said, it is important. It is definitely important for the way the e NUG has unfolded, for the way the CDM has unfolded, the entire thing has happened. We have to support that because that is about restoration of democracy in Myanmar. But having said that, I think there is also there are also other structures around that we cannot ignore. There are there is the international government, there is the UN, there is the ASEAN, there are the neighborhood countries like India. And whatever is happening in Myanmar today has huge regional ramifications, security, commercial interest, and reputation of all these uh, regional entities that are there. So I think I will combine India and ASEAN together because India has fallen, let's say not behind ASEAN, but together alongside ASEAN saying that whatever ASEAN does, which is what the Western world and Europe has said that whatever ASEAN does and ASEAN has to sort of implement the five point consensus and we are behind the ASEAN. Now, we have to understand, uh, I mean, before I come to ASEAN, let me just also make it clear that India's position has been very clear. And I just want to, before I start, just quote our uh, permanent representative to the UN and the president of the UNSC now was actually clearly said, and we, this is very important. He said, so uh, he says, we are deeply concerned about the developments in Myanmar. We have condemned the use of violence in Myanmar. We have urged maximum restraint. We believe that there can be no falling back on the path to democracy in Myanmar. So I think that is very clear. India's position is very clear. India does not want to destabilize Myanmar because for India, Myanmar has been important, not now, but historically important. And you know, I don't believe in this argument that I have come across in several uh, discussions and also I uh, kind of writings where I see that India's Myanmar relation is about counterweight to China. No, India has a historical relationship with Myanmar and that continues. As I said in another conference, we were together that we have a lot of goodwill and that goodwill is going to remain. Now, coming to how the ASEAN is going to play out, I think the ASEAN's role so far has been very circumspect. And you see, we have to understand that ASEAN, here there is a huge security and the costs are very high on the ASEAN itself, security, commercial interest, and the reputation of the ASEAN, because whatever is happening in Myanmar today, it is rippling across Southeast Asia. I'm talking about Southeast Asia here, and our borders as well in the Northeast. Uh, India, we share 1,600 kilometers plus border with Myanmar. So I think whatever ASEAN does is very important, but what is ASEAN doing? I mean, I'll just tell you, I had a conversation with a friend today who is very closely following. He's part of an uh, international organization that looks after Asian democracy. And he told me today that the foreign minister, the se second foreign minister of Brunei, is now being actually deputed to go to Cambodia for first before going to Myanmar. I mean, what is it going to, why, what, what are the discussions is going to have with the Cambodian government? So different kinds of things here. At least the maritime democracies in the ASEAN, like Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, they have raised their voice. They have, I think, made more protests. They have spoken out more. They have condemned the coup. Uh, then what Thailand has done, probably because, you know, we know Thailand is a post-coup government itself, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam. But let us also remember and not forget, I mean, I think we also have to call out the hypocrisies. Singapore is the largest investor in Myanmar today. It invests more than 24.1 billion US dollar in Myanmar. And next comes China, which is 21.1 billion dollar something. And all the bank accounts of the generals and the cronies are stacked in Singapore. It's in the Singaporean banks. So what are we talking about? Even if you make those noises, it really doesn't help for the ASEAN to really come together as a unit to help Myanmar in this crisis. And let us also not forget that ASEAN is not a monolithic structure. They have their own problem inside, internally and externally. And I have always said this before in any of any conferences or meetings or discussion that the ASEAN Charter has this clause of non-interference, which is going to be the problem. So for ASEAN to even push the five point consensus forward and to see that there is a solution, I see no hope. 
Now, I would like to sort of what I believe, and I personally believe, I know what the energy and what Mathinzar has just said is so important, but given our own situation and the security situation in the Northeast Sea, India has always been interested in developing the infrastructure in Myanmar. India has never been militarily involved. It will never be militarily involved. India is worried about its own strategic concerns. The borders are porous. There's been drug trafficking, a lot of, even till recently, I mean, just uh, about two months back, there's been a huge uh, ca uh, capture of um, uh, drugs, gold, uh, and even weapons that were smuggled out through Mizoram. And uh, India is concerned. The other thing is, of course, insurgency and militancy, which continues to happen, the cross-border thing. And therefore, I think India will continue to walk the tightrope between the military and the democracy uh, uh, movement in Myanmar, but I think what is required now for India to, and I've been saying this, it is important for India to stand, uh, to, to listen to the voices of the people. If the government is taken, a, if the government has taken a certain position, I think it is the responsibility for us, the civil society, to continue to speak out, to continue to stand alongside the the, the, the NUG people that are heading the CDM and other movements for restoration of democracy in Myanmar. And I think I would go with what Kristen Bergner, the UN special convoy to Myanmar has said. I think she said something very important. See, I believe in dialogue. Now I'm not saying we are going to, I mean, I understand there's been this uh, resistance to dialogue and a lot of my friends who are activists and organizations in Myanmar have been debating with me that no, why should we dialogue with the military because we don't trust the military. But listen, we let us not forget that the military is not alone. We have to look at where China is today, where Russia is today and how they are supporting Myanmar and how all that is going to play out in the international arena, especially the UN, right? So this is very important. And today, when uh, Mr. Myung Lai has declared himself as the prime minister, he's also trying to gain international legitimacy. So we don't know how all that is going to unfold. But what Kristen Bergner has said, I just want to close by saying what she has said. She's spoken to all the stakeholders, including the deputy commander of the military. And she's saying that a dialogue is possible. The military has not said yes or no, but a dialogue with preconditions. And because Myanmar, even if NUG comes to government, look, we'll need a military infrastructure. Myanmar just, and because it is about security, Myanmar cannot create this vacuum. And you have China, you have other countries that can actually um, uh, use or misuse the kind of vacuum that is created. So this is where I think we've got to be extremely careful while we talk about Myanmar and the fluidity that it creates in the immediate borders and also in the region. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vidai. Thanks a lot for um, you know your reading of the com fairly complex regional dynamics. Uh, there are various sort of uh, issues at hand when thinking about Myanmar, of course, it's a complex issue. Um, all right, I think, uh, we have okay we have we are in the 415 so we're comfortably uh, on time so, so far uh, our last speaker is chavi vashisht who is a research associate at vif chavi please go ahead thank you anshuman uh, thank you nice ayas for giving this opportunity and interacting with the scholars here so my uh, presentation is basically on a setback to democracy and human rights in myanmar uh, a lot has already been said and uh, it is known now that it has been 208 days since the military declared a hegemonic shape and has taken control in Myanmar. This political crisis has uh, led to a humanitarian crisis, and, uh, but this is not something which is restricted to Myanmar, as we have seen Afghanistan is facing the state same. And the democratic institutions which were supposed, uh, like in the last 20th century, it was believed that they will have a control across the world. This progress, which was made in 20th century, has somewhat stalled in 21st century. And if we see the Freedom House report, uh, Nations in Transit, the 2021 edition, it has noted that total of 18 countries has suffered, suffered uh, democratic uh, institutions decline. So what we are seeing in Myanmar is uh, not new. It's, it's something which has happened before. The coup has happened before. And uh, this genesis, I mean, it, when we talk about the current crisis, we have to see how military was strong since the declaration of independence. In the 1948 itself, the military had taken itself as the ultimate defender of the country. And that is the reason that the pride they take in themselves and they believe that the old tactics that they had, they would continue with the same tactics and uh, rule the country. 
so they did not uh, the commander in chief uh, did not really think of the consequences that this coup would have in the 21st century when the youth in the country as uh, kunza already stated that the youth in the country are so aware they they have uh, for a decade for 10 years they have felt the democracy working they have seen the democracy in shape and they have lived in those times given the prevalence of social media given the prevalence of internet they can no more be secluded the way they were done in the 1990s but however talking about the military the military had laid a strong foundation for its economic and political control not just in since the 1948 when it started taking control over the political institutions and economic institutions but also in the constitution itself the 2008 constitution the various provisions we all are aware of those provisions for example the 75% uh, share the way in the way where they say that if a amendment has to take place it has to be more than 75% but it is clearly known that 25% is held by the military so any constitutional amendment can only take place if there is a consent of the military and therefore we see that no significant constitutional amendment was taken place in the last 10 years so the democracy which actually took shape since the 2010 and the progress that was made since 2010 it was so easy for the military to control this democracy that declaration of a coup was not something that came as a shock uh, when the elections were declared there were political experts who were who were suggesting that a coup would be in the in the process or there must there will be something that uh, that will take the military and make sure that the civilian government doesn't do now this is a liberal conception of democracy that we're looking at that where we want the majority will to rule over the country at the same time there is a concept of social democracy where we are looking that this democracy should be inclusive but since the 2020s or since the declaration of uh, independence in myanmar was this democracy actually inclusive we see that this uh, democratic process that took shape in myanmar has left behind not just the ethnic groups but has also taken a hegemonic shape in in the sense that it has created violence and made this feeling of bamar majority felt inside the country and the other half the other people in the country are not feeling the nationalist tendencies they are not feeling close to the idea of nation myanmar as a nation has actually failed and uh, state as it is has now been a failed state and it has also turned to be a failed nation uh, talking about the current situation uh, tinza and sir budak sir has already highlighted the current state is an emergency nug has abolished the 2008 constitution and they are trying to give shape to a new federal uh, democracy charter that was declared on 31st march but is whatever the nug is doing and recently now there are voices that whether nug whatever it is doing is actually sufficient for the country and actually sufficient to overthrow the military rule so the questions are raising there itself uh, ethnic armed, armed organization there is internal conflicts among ethnic armed organizations uh extensive protest has been there not uh, since the declaration of uh, coup the human rights watch has been uh, coming up with the with the reports uh, the human rights commission has also been coming up with, with the reports and the recent uh, survey that was done it said that the internally displaced people uh, currently 3 million people are in need in myanmar covid-19 situation yes the, it is worst uh not just the testing uh, not just the you know taking care of the people where the military is now trying to control the oxygen cylinders and the, uh, attacking the doctors itself the testing is also poor so what numbers that we have seen are a complete understatement uh, what i would like to add here is the me- media freedom which is being curtailed when this was declared on march 8 itself uh, the military curbed and stopped the five major outlets of media and apart from that the reporters without borders have reported that myanmar now stands at 140th position uh, in 180 countries and that shows a dismal position of where the media is standing and on the line of what media is facing is the internet internet availability is shut down uh, myanmar is uh, the military is trying to control uh, internet access to the people and these developments clearly state that we are not facing it is not just the democratic that we have to set in a democratic state we have to see how how this democracy has been flaunted how this democracy is no more a, a inclusive democracy in the country 
Also, there was another report which stated that they are curbing religious freedom. I mean, you just talk about a thing, talk about an inclusive uh, aspect of democracy and the military is flouting that. I would uh, skip this portion and I would just like to mention here that the economy itself, I mean, the way the military is trying to shape the economy, it is in crisis. The World Bank reported that now the country has declined further to 18%. And uh, whatever progress that it was making since the declaration of uh, the new constitution, it has taken a setback. This brings to the point that uh, the CAF exchange rate has gone down, the jobs unemployment has increased in the country, and the international reactions are mixed. The funding has stopped, uh, the Western countries are proclaiming that they would not support the country, uh, the military government, but this whole process is a very mixed reaction where we do we do not we are not looking for a solution. We are isolating the military administration, as Vidhayak sir said. We isolating is no solution. Dialogue is the solution. You cannot even have a complete arms embargo because that would again make all the control of the country in the hands of military. And China and Russia, who are the main supporters for the arms uh, supply, they will continue to support, and they are supporting it. The recent uh, Russian government, they sent the uh, weapons to the country. Talking about India, India uh, has not really condemned the situation. Uh, we have raised our concerns, but as Vidaksa said, we are keeping a lip service to it. We are not declaring uh, anything from our side. And that brings to the point that we have our own strategic and economic interest in the country. India also abstained from uh, voting at the United Nations conference. And India is simply adopting a wait and watch approach. You are waiting how the uh, situation would take shape. But on the other side, we see that the Northeast governments have been quite proactive and have been supporting, the state governments have been supporting the refugee crisis that has set in. The people from Myanmar and the border uh, states are coming to the Northeastern states and they have been uh, supporting them and taking care of them, giving them shelter, despite the directives from the central government. So the current situation of the country is uh, perilous, it is sad. Uh, but here we have to look at the solution, a solution where we can only ensure that by dialogue, we can bring both the parties and not just both the parties. I would uh, always say that NEG is not the true representative of the uh, all the stakeholders. So we need all the ethnic armed organizations together, the Myanmar military and the NEG to come on the table and decide what has to be the solution for the country. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chavi. Thank you for your uh, very comprehensive remarks. I think you covered a lot of ground. Again, um, I have a set of questions. I think I'll come to them now uh, for everyone. Um, I don't think I see any questions per se on the chat box yet. Uh, so everyone watching, feel free to drop in your questions. This is a good time to do so. We have another uh, about 20, 20 minutes or so to uh, have a discussion uh, on this. And I'm going to take my chair's privilege to uh, ask the first set of questions. Um, Thinzar, I'll come to you first. Um, so, you know, one of the things that has happened over the last few months, in addition to the civil disobedience movement, and you talked about this in passing, uh, is a sort of armed resistance uh, to the coup, uh, which is an emerging pattern. And it's a very, very fluid situation on the ground. And, you know, we have seen that various civilian groups have into armed groups often using, you know, even like crude homemade weapons. Um, and, you know, these groups are now being referred to as People's Defense Forces or PDFs. At the same time, the NUG itself has uh, launched or sort of uh, uh, created its own PDF, um, uh, sort of, which it means, which it wants to be a sort of federal PDF or a much more united or comprehensive kind of PDF. Uh, now, how do you see this? How do you see this sort of surging uh, armed resistance to the military, uh, not just in the ethnic areas, which we have been seeing for a long time, but also in the Bamar heartland? Uh, including key cities like Yangon, Mandalay, Bago, um, and also in Sagaing region, which has been a hotspot of these armed resistance, and also in Kaya state. So, do you do you believe that there is some possibility of these very disparate PDFs coming together to form sort of one united federal front against the military? And do you think it's going to sustain? Thank you. So over the past um, seven months or so, you know, we have witnessed an conflict in almost every states and region in 14 towns. 14, we have 14 states and regions. The only state that we have no conflict was in Oregon State, in Rakhine State. 
So uh, also the number of the clashes increased basically, um, you know, um, quite different from the, in the past 10 years, we, we only saw those conflict in the ethnic areas that now we are seeing more in the other different Bama control area, Bama like majority areas like Sakai, as I mentioned. Sakai already have more than 1, 000, uh, 100 clashes with the military Honda. And um, so what we are seeing is the BDF also was like, you know, after KIO, KIA and after KNLE, the PDF are the third feathers that they are undertaking serious uh, conflict with the military Honda. So basically the way the PDF was formed and the way PDF are acting themselves is like a, like a military, a, a true military of a country. That's how they try to perceive and trying to sustain they, themselves in a way that because the military, um, we, we uh, in the general public, the narrative against the military is so strong that we are seeing military as a terrorist group, you know, so that we don't have military anymore. We don't have a nation's military anymore. We only have a terrorist group um, bullying the whole country, using M's, trying to take control. So that very visit, um, you know, line. So we are trying to replace the whole military with a new government, a new military. And that's how I felt um, the national unity governments form their own army and trying to form a federal army. Uh, so that's the goal. So for that, there are different stuff. It's not like, you, could, you know, the military itself was built upon like in the past 70 years, they were building, it's, it's a strong institution in the country. So it's easier said than down. It's really hard. Um, so now I, the NUG and also different political stakeholders are trying to build trust among themselves to form a, a constitution as well as that constitution will enable different ends army to come together as a federal army. So that's the main goal. And now we are stay on the way. And I feel we, we, we are hopeful because before it was super confusing in the past 10 years and the 2008 constitution mainly drafted by military. We felt like we are in the democratic transition. Basically we were not. We were just um, uh, kind of in the illusion by the military. The military just guides everyone. They're trying to misuse and you know abuse um, the international support and the dialogue that people are saying. The international community has been forcing the, the political stakeholder to go under the 2008 constitution in the past 10 years. Where, where are we now? We're just going back to the um, zero, you know, ground zero. So we this time we need to be super careful and. Um, strategy against the military. Thanks, Martin Sar. I think there's a question for you in the chat box from Jaydeep Chanda, um, who is, by the way, also a very, very close observer and watcher of Myanmar um, and has recently really published a book called The Irrawaddy Imperative. Um, you might want to, uh, you know, get the book and um, he particularly looks at the security dynamics. So it's an interesting question. Um, are there any signs of desertions in the army gaining momentum? Uh, is there a chance the army implodes internally? I think it's an interesting question because we have seen uh, many desertions from not just the military, but also police forces across Myanmar uh, over the past few months. And uh, they seem to be picking up, but yes, what's your reading of it? Uh, we are seeing the biggest desertions, you know, that never happened in the past 70 years. That's what the KNU leader who have been fighting against the Hondar for the past 70 years, they say this is the, the biggest desertation ever they have been seeing because for uh, for them, for the ethnic ends army, their main uh, strategy is to have more desertation and that they clearly see this is happening right now, not just even from the military, but also from police as well as the civilian staff who were supporting the military. Now they're changing their sides and becoming a democracy, uh, pro-democracy people and they're joining in. So I felt that's how the um, ethnic ends leader and through leaders being trying to get into this revolution because this is something they have never seen before. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um... We have a question from Abhishek Sharma, but I believe it's more of a generic question and anyone, if anyone wishes to take that, they could. Has the situation in Afghanistan proved that the issue of Western project to protect and propagate Western style liberal democracy around the world will now be moving forward, moving forward will now be limited to just words and resolutions and nothing else, as even sanctions uh, don't, uh, don't work now? I think I'll take the opportunity, since it's a non-specific question, I'll take the opportunity of what is mentioned at the end, which is sanctions. 
I think this is one topic that has been hotly debated across decades with respect to Myanmar, uh, particularly. So perhaps uh, Bidhag, I'll come to you now. How how do you see? Do you do you do you believe that sanctions on the Myanmar military from the West, particularly, uh, because sanctions right now are coming from only the West, um, not the region. Do you think the sanction approach works with the military, or do you think the military just doesn't care about sanctions because it has its own sources of funding? Um, how do you see the this this entire issue? Uh, you are mute, Vidhag. Uh, Yes, sorry. Uh, the answer, Angshuman, I think it's uh, it's all known to us and uh, how the military uh, has functioned in the past, uh, despite sanctions. And those sanctions were harsh san sanctions, but the military continued to function. We know who their uh, supporters were, and those supporters are going to remain. And there is also a different kind of an economy that flourishes in Myanmar. Let us not forget the drug economy is a huge economy in Myanmar. Right, that keeps on supporting them, but that's not all. There are also support that comes from across the Buddha. Then there are the neighbor, the neighboring countries like Thailand, uh, the the ASEAN countries. These actually are also very important because they've constantly engaged with Myanmar uh, in the past when the regime ruled the country for so long. Uh, that's how I think. So for me, really, sanctions will not work the way it maybe it has worked in the past. I think we've got to look at it in a different perspective. I would just like to come to this question, which I think is linked and important and somebody has asked, and it is linked to this question of democracy, the Western model, does it work? This was a question actually, which was asked in the panel yesterday in Afghanistan as well. See, I worked most of my time in Myanmar from 2008, from the referendum until 2015, I was there for elections, mostly observing election training, engaging with the election commission. What I personally think that it works but you know what happens? The problem with the Western model is that the Western model is they, there is a tendency to impose the model on you. There, there is, I mean, so the, it, the, it's not a participatory approach. You don't have stakeholders, especially locals who are actually participating and locals that are participating, I think don't represent the voices of all the people or the ethnicities that are there in Myanmar. That is why I think the democracy experiment in Myanmar, I would say, failed because the 2015 democracy experiment, the elections, I tell you, I was there, we observed it. It was by and large clean and credible, and at least the way it was managed. And uh, it was accepted across, uh, across the board inside Myanmar and also the international community. And I think that is how we have to understand. But yes, uh, I think people are important. The Burmese people, the, all the ethnicities across Burm, uh, the country are important who have to be involved. And I think they were not involved. The constitution remains, I think the previous speaker before, uh, after me um, uh, said, the constitution will remain a hindrance. As long as the con constitution remains like this, uh, I don't think we are going anywhere. Just very quickly, just give me 10 more seconds. I would like to just mention this that you all have mentioned. See, in terms of the armed conflict, you know it better. You've been following this and the others have uh, we all know that the now there is a now there is a talk about unity but you see the groups are diverse there are conflicts between themselves the groups that are supported by china the war the northern alliance not the northern alliance in afghanistan but the northern alliance here in myanmar uh, they are they are totally they uh, sort of uh, listen to what beijing or let's say what comes out of kunming the headquarter there that actually tries to uh, uh, guide them. And then we have the other groups that have been constantly against each other. Now if that unity can come together, the PDF can join the rebel groups and then they can take on the uh, junta. That's a different thing. I really don't know what's going to happen. The other crucial thing, last point that I want to mention is Rakhine. Angshuman, and you know it, Rakhine is going to be a crucial factor here. The Arakan army is going to be a crucial factor here because the Rakhine, for all I know, and I can say this, I think, without any hesitation, the Rakhines, the Arakan army, and all the other groups that are there that make up the Arakan uh, region, Rakhine, they are not going to accept the Rohingyas within the quote-unquote Rohingya terminology. They are going to look at them as interlopers of Bengalis, and that is going to be a point of contention going forward. Yes. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Rakhine because there's some interesting developments happening there. It's, it's perhaps one of the most fascinating things that's happening in Myanmar today. 
uh, which is it's not just the military but the Arakan army, which is the Rakhine uh, ethnic group, uh, armed group there, um, you know, has talked about and, and they are running a sort of parallel government in parts of Rakhine state right now. Um, and interestingly, they have talked about including the Rohingya in administrative and law enforcement structures, um, which is very interesting. It's it's an, it's a very recent development. I think the, the statement was made earlier this week by the Arakan army chief. So it's a very, very fluid and complex situation. We never know which way it's going because the Arakan army also has a ceasefire, temporary ceasefire with the Myanmar military, but it's also fighting in certain fronts in the north. So it's essentially maddeningly complex, the conflict situation there, the political dynamics. Uh, okay, mm, we have okay, uh, we have a question from Najibullah Fezi on Afghanistan. Uh, Mr. Fezi, I'm, as much as we'd like to answer it, but unfortunately this is a panel on uh, Myanmar. Uh, perhaps you, you could, if uh, the speakers, uh, if anyone wants to take the question, they could drop in their email ID on something and Mr. Fezi could answer it. Uh, Mr. Fazi could send the question to them. Perhaps Vidhayaki would also be well pleased to talk about this. Um, yes, you might want to drop your email ID if if you are comfortable with that, and Mr. Fazi can send you the question. Um, uh, we have a comment from uh, Sao Khon Cho, who's from Myanmar, and he says, "Thank you for understanding our situation. We are undermining peace by the Burmese army, and many human rights violations uh, are being violated. Many women and children are being killed. The number of war victims is increasing." I understand the military will not pay attention to international pressure for this. I would like to suggest what we young people should do next. Okay, I'll come to this to Tinzar um, because that's a very pointed question and Tinzar is extremely well placed to answer that. Uh, but before that, Chavi, I uh, wanted to get your opinion um, on on sort of this this question of let's say the NUG. You have been tracking the news about Myanmar, and do you believe the NUG as a parallel government uh, will sustain? according to your reading of the situation that you know it it will it will be a government that will be able to get universal across the board uh, understanding and solidarity from all ethnic groups or do you think despite all the efforts nug will still be seen as essentially uh, bamar sort of political formation how do you see the situation right thank uh, you so thank uh, Tindar, sorry i mean sorry i'm if i was not clear things are as i'd asked the question to chavi i'll come to you with the different question which uh, uh, Sao Khon Cho has asked mm -hmm. after Chavi. Chavi, please go ahead. Thank you. So, uh, Anshuman, the situation is that NUG formed after uh, the military coup and they tried to bring in the other ethnic armed organizations. But as I said earlier in my presentation, these ethnic armed organizations, though on the surface may seem that they are united on the front, but they have their internal differences. And NUG, since uh, since they won the elections in 2015 also, they did not make then the efforts to bring in, uh, bring in the peace process. They did not make efforts then to include the ethnic armed organization and they continued their exclusion of the ethnic armed organization. So now they are doing it for their own benefit. And this thing is being realized by ethnic armed organization and they are fighting on their own front also. They are giving us a slight support, but there are organizations like Kachan and all who have not given support to the NUG as of now. So they indirectly, they are saying that they are with the NUG, but on the surface of it, they are fighting their own battles in the, on the ground. And uh, as far as Arakan army is concerned, I see a very different uh, development in the context that till 2020, till the elections, uh, the military was not at all ready to negotiate with them and they were continuing their attacks. All of a sudden, when they lost the elections, they started wooing the Arakan army to use it against their own battle. And that's the reason that Arakan army is not being either supportive of energy or being supportive of military. They are playing their own game. They have set up their own administration. And as you said, they have set up their own parallel government. So it is a very dicey situation. And uh, more recently, I read the article uh, which stated that now it is the time that energy efforts need to enhance. Otherwise, it is ought to fail. Because whatever it is doing till now, it's mere lip service. You cannot just say that, okay, you will bring back Rohingyas, give them the citizenship rights, but not do anything about it. Not even a single Rohingya has been uh, repatriated till date. And uh, the civilian government was in power when the crisis actually happened, when the deadly attack was actually done. So is the, uh, the energy, which is formed by the ousted government, is it actually taking a stand for the ethnic minorities? That is on the first place questionable. So its sustenance depends now that whether it does the actions and do take steps toward bringing an inclusive democracy. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chavi. I think that's a very insightful answer. Uh, we are at the last leg of this webinar, so I'll uh, quickly move on to uh, Tinza now for the last set of questions. And Tinza, uh, if you want to weigh in on my previous question regarding NUG, please feel free to do so also. Uh, but beyond that, we have a question from, as I said, Mr. Sa uh, uh, Sao who asks uh, at the end of his question, I think it's quite relevant, what do you suggest that the young people in Myanmar do? You have, a, you have been at the forefront of um, mobilizing uh, resistance not just on the streets but also on the internet which is a, a new feature in the anti-coup movements or sort of the anti-coup sentiments in Myanmar. We haven't seen that uh, in the previous uh, revolution so to say in 2007 or 1988. Uh, so uh, in, in terms of you know mobilizing on new mediums such as the internet and social media also how do you think uh, should the young people of Myanmar go move from here uh, in terms of charting out a new political future? Thank you. Thank you, Sir Kuncho, um, for your questions, for your uh, participation here as well. So regarding the previous questions, I just want to add a bit like um, the NUG itself or ourself, you know, we, we take NUG is, um, at the front line of the revolution, but they are not just the only one in the front line. You know, we have other different political factors like uh, the student leaders, as well as strike committees. We take them as the same position, just like the leaders of the whole revolution. So the revolution is full blown in different manner in a dynamic position. At the same time, the NUG is in the official position, but that does not mean that we are only relying on NUG to do everything. You know, we are trying as, as well as the young populations are really careful with that. If we cannot be hopeful with the NUG, what's next? Like what's gonna be there, right? So that's the main strategy question for all of, it's the main challenge as well. And we are also working out on this. Um, so uh, for us, like we are tackling, uh, tackling the, uh, the military um, occupations, right, in our administrations and executive pillar and everything. We are trying to counter that. At the same time, we are at the same time in the parallel process. We are building our own new nation for a federal democratic nation. And now we see this as, um, as you have clearly stated, you know, our sister has clearly stated about the past mistakes that uh, previous the National League for Democracy have done at the same time, the successive governments, what they have done in the past against the ethnic minorities and the Rohingyas, you know, they are trying, they have to repair and they need to show a true sincere political will that they are coming together with a sincere um, will for the better future, not just because they are in the vulnerable situation. That's why they are talking like we support uh, Rohingya, we support Karen, it shouldn't be like that. So we are also being careful with that and it will take time because you see there is a big burden of mistrust and not just from one ethnic group but also from almost every ethnic group not just even from ethnic group but also from activists student leader even from the young activists like me i will say mm, i will be super careful with this right so that's that's what we are worried with the NUG leaders um, that comprise with the 60, more than 60% of the Burmese population. So they need to shepherd their own structure, make sure it's all inclusive and in a new structure, you know, for a new nation, then it could be repair, it could be, you know, sustained. So now um, NUCC, the Consolidated Council is trying to take control of the NUG and let's see what, what comes next, right? And regarding the question from set control, I would encourage our young people to uh, work on to how like to motivate each other because now we're losing hopes and also momentum. Like, so even though there are different strides going on, but at the same time, deep down in our heart, like what's next? Um, we are bearing with different atrocity happening every day. It's becoming a mental burden for us. We need to inspire each other, motivate each other. At the same time, make sure whatever we are doing is not just a revenge act. You know, in, it's, it should come from an ideological change. So we need to learn the truth, like what should be changed ideologically, the mentally, you know, uh, so that we could have a behavioral change. Then we can eventually have a, a new um, uh, generation for the new nation. So I think that's that will be super important work for all our generations right now. Thank you, Martin, for your very, not just insightful, but very profoundly meaningful uh, uh, comments on the situation. We are at the absolute last minute of this webinar. Again, Mr. Fezi has another question for uh, Tinzar. Um, I'm really sorry. I really wish I could take this, but after this, I think Pramod is just going to cut us off um, because um, I think I've we have slightly overshot the time limit that he gave us. 
but uh, i think we have covered so much ground i think this was a fantastic discussion very very enriching and insightful discussion myanmar is an issue that always takes hours to discuss because it has so many facets it has so many dimensions uh, and uh, at a level it's so complex there are no easy answers but at the same time certain questions do have easy answers which is and there are certain red lines that um, un- cannot be shrouded in uh, you know the, in a veneer of complexity for instance the crackdown the brutal deadly crackdown on civilian life unarmed civilians um, and others so thank you very much matinzar Vidhayak and Chavi for joining us today and once again thank you Pramod and Nice for putting this together for arranging this and I wish you and I wish Nice all the best for rest of the conference and our panelists uh, I hope you have a good weekend and everyone who joined us patiently ask questions listen to us thank you so much for being a patient audience thank you thank you everyone thank you Anshuman thank you Vidhayak thank you brother and sister thank you Distinguished chair, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, as we have come to the end of this session, we would like to express a sincere gratitude and thanks to the chair for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today. A sincere thanks also goes to all the speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such comprehensive and convincing presentations. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media and different organizations. Finally, we must also mention our deep sense of appreciation for the audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live. Thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making this session productive with your questions. Once again, we are truly honored to have you all with us today. Please do join us in the next session. Thank you so much.